Uh, game Theory Part 1 Game Stories Most people have heard of Prisoner's Dilemma. Why? What mythical properties does this 2x2 two two grid of decisions and payoffs have to shape the way we see society, prehistory, warfare and commerce? This video is meant to act as a gentle introduction to game theory from a critical perspective. Here I will examine some simple games and the common narratives associated with them and talk about how these narratives affect the way we use these ideas as modern day parables. I'm going to base most of this video on a paper by Carol Rose, which looks at game theory ideas used in economic law, focusing on the gender coding of many of the stories most commonly associated with different games. I'm going to briefly outline where I want to go with the series after this video. Don't worry if it sounds overly technical and doesn't make much sense now. It will be explained in full length later. So it may be worth returning to this a bit later to see how everything fits together. I'll also add a timestamp so you can skip this bit if you want to. The next video will look at more generalized games, repeated games, games with continuous rather than discrete choices, and games with more than two players, etc etc. These are important to understand to see how game theory is used to explain a wider range of ideas. For example, the tragedy of commons can be understood as a multiplayer version of Prisoner's Dilemma with continuous choices. I'll also look at some critiques of the idea of Nash equilibrium that emerge here. How altruism, trust, bluffing and limited ability to calculate all possible outcomes from games can all result in non-Nash equilibrium solutions, limiting the predictive power of game theory. After this, I'll look at some evolutionary game theory, where players can spawn off, die, and imitate strategies. Mm. Evolutionary game theory has a major advantage, that it does not need to assume hyper-rational behavior that traditional game theory needs in order to prove that equilibrium will emerge. Nevertheless, the way evolution is modeled in these theories is quite limiting, and does not allow for more coordinated politics and social forces in many ways. Throughout, the idea of social norms and institutions offer a way out of bad equilibrium and the chaos of disequilibrium. But I will only examine the relationship between game theory and new institutional economics in more depth later on. Finally, I will look at how game theory can be used to retell a liberal story of prehistory, serving as a mathematical microfoundational basis for ideas like social contracts, consent to government, and the emergence of private property and markets and social norms governing kinship. Throughout, there are three forms of criticism which emerge around game theory. The first is simply that game theory itself is useful, but often theorists can pick the wrong game to explain something based either on their own poor understanding or of ideological bias, and they desire to use game theory to support a particular social narrative. The second stronger critique is the new institutional one, which argues that while game theory can correctly describe the choices and payoffs faced by different actors, it frequently results in either disequilibrium or suboptimal equilibrium, but that institutions can often be understood as solutions to this. The third, most radical critique argues against even the synthesis of game theory and new institutional economics arguing that the simple payoffs of game theory fail to explain the complexities of human motivation, and that understanding institutions simply as solutions emerging out of poor results of games leads to a poor and ahistorical understanding of institutions and social norms with a misguided basis in microfoundations. I, I tend, tend towards the third criticism, but, but I will explain, explain all three throughout the series. series. And, in this specific video, I will focus on the first, as it provides a simpler introduction. Okay, back to Prisoner's Dilemma. For the uninitiated, here is the original story. Two prisoners are in jail awaiting trial, and are being kept separately and cannot communicate with each other. The police have enough evidence to convict both prisoners of a minor crime, for which they will both receive one year prison sentence but not enough to convict either prisoner of a more major crime unless the other prisoner testifies against them. 
if only one prisoner testifies, the other is sentenced to three years, while they are set off free. And if both testify against each other, then both get two years. The point of this is that the best social outcome, i.e. where there is the lowest total years of prison time, happens when both prisoners keep their mouths shut. But both prisoners are also always individually better off betraying each other, whether or not they are betrayed themselves. And hence, if they both act in a rational way, we end up with the worst possible scenario, and a total of four prison years. This is the Nash equilibrium of the game, which means, according to game theory, it is a stable and almost inevitable outcome of the game between rational players. We'll get to a formal mathematical way to derive this later, and also offer some critiques. For now though, we just need to understand its role in the narrative as the inevitable outcome. It also draws interesting parallels to more traditional narrative devices of self-fulfilling prophecies. It is just a mathematical self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways. Um, and that's also an interesting parallel to all the forms of myths to the thing. Let's look at some other similar games and corresponding narratives to try and see what is different about Prison's Dilemma, which makes it so widely adopted in comparison. There are six other games which take place between two players with two choices and, between, and one between two players with three choices each that can serve as interesting comparisons. 1. Rock, Paper, Scissors 2. The Invisible Hand 3. Weak Assurance 4. The Stag Hunt 5. Chicken and 6. Battle of the Sexes a lot of the stories linked to these games seem kind of dated, but the point is to re-examine the original, most popular narratives associated with the games, rather than invent new, more PC alternatives, because I'm trying to explain the original narratives and why they became so popular with them. I'm just skimming through these now, if you do need to, just pause and examine the payoff structure closely until it makes sense. We begin with two games with no strategic interest. The first is Rock, Paper, Scissors. Here, there's no predictable move from either player, and no equilibrium solution, apart from randomly picking between the three choices with a semblance of equal likelihood. Any sign of favouring one option statistically puts one at a disadvantage. At the other extreme, we get a game called Invisible Hand, where both players do best, both individually and collectively, by pursuing their own self-interest. No matter what the other player does, this is an entirely unstrategic game. An example, given by the core textbook, is two farmers, each selling at a community market to a much wider set of buyers. The farmers gain from specialisation and trade, not with each other, but with the market, where each specialises for their own self-interest, but the result is a greater social surplus, and they benefit from specialisation whether or not the other farmer specialises. Although the other farmer's choice may affect the magnitude, but not the ranking of their choices. A departure from this would harm both the self-interest of the individual player, making the departure, and all other players. It's not just popular pedagogy that has very little interest in these games. Game theory itself has very little interest in them. If we do in fact live in a world dominated by rock, paper, scissors type games, then game theory can't predict anything about the real world. While if we live in a world dominated by invisible hand games, game theory would still work, but it's more complicated than needed, considering that most things would not require any strategic thinking. Moving on to games which illustrate game theory better, we can start with weak assurance, where coordinating with a partner is the only important thing. Think about driving on the right or left side of the road. The only important thing is avoiding collisions. This doesn't offer a terribly gripping narrative and there's no real tension or conflict of interest between the two protagonists. So it's not hard to see why Prisoner's Dilemma is the more intriguing game. But this story also has a much more dramatic payoff matrix. Chicken. Here, two drivers head straight towards each other and the first one to swerve is Chicken. Obviously, not crashing is still ideal for everyone here. But there are also a strategic benefit 
to being the one not to swerve. This matrix can also be interpreted in a way which is much less involved with nihilistic machismo. Instead, focusing on conflict over much more tangible resources than status, creating a story of property rights, or of biological evolution of both true and mock conflict in the animal world. Here it is often labelled the dove and hawk game. Confusingly, doves and hawks aren't normally different species, but rather different members of the same species, who choose different strategies. Hawks always threaten a fight. Doves always avoid a fight. There are two Nash equilibrium, stable states in this game, where one player plays hawk and the other plays dove. The next game has the same Nash equilibrium with unequal payoffs, but there is a greater benefit to both players in entering either one of the unequal solutions. This is often known as the battle of the sexes. The story starts with a married couple. He wants to go to a prize fight and she wants to go to the ballet, but they both want to be together. Here, the two possible Nash equilibrium are where both go to the prize fight or both go to the ballet, and they are, are happier accompanying their spouse to an activity they don't like than going alone to do what they actually want to do. But who gets to pick the mutual activity is still grounds for conflict. The final game, Stag Hunt, is a story from Rousseau when discussing the origins of language. Here, two hunters must cooperate in order to bring down a stag, but either may be distracted and chased on a rabbit instead. Here, if the other hunter cooperates, then there's no incentive to get distracted, but if the other hunter does get distracted, then one hunter can't bring down the stag alone. This is often known as the assurance game. So why does Prisoner's Dilemma emerge as the most popular of these stories? It's relatively complex and counterintuitive. Carol Rose examines a number of reasons why Prisoner's Dilemma was widely adopted in economic law discourse, while not really coming to a definitive conclusion on which is the ultimate reason, if there is even an ultimate reason. The most obvious answer is just that it is most likely to be found in actual real-life instances, however it's far from clear that this is the case. In addition, she argues that there are numerous instances of other games being falsely labelled Prisoner's Dilemma, which gives some support to the notion that there must be another reason. One earlier legal scholar she cites, Richard McAdams, argues that it is a structural feature of the payoffs which interests most people. It has a single Nash equilibrium. There is no distributional conflict. And there is an inherent bias for more legal solutions to get away from the nasty Nash equilibrium to a more socially optimal solution. While this may be true of the simplistic form of prisoner's dilemma, it can easily be altered slightly to change all three, and indeed, maybe it is this malleability which makes prisoner's dilemma so popular. To, to understand why this doesn't work, let's look at another story associated with the game, moving it into the more mundane arena of commerce. Deal or steal? Here, two merchants make a once of trade meeting in the wilderness. They can either trade or try to steal each other's wares. They can either trade fairly or try to con each other. Here we can see more clearly what non-legal institutions and social norms may make trade the preferred option and also how the distribution of benefits from trade are often not commonly equal and hence how, in a more mundane situation, distributional conflicts can enter into the dynamics of prisoner's dilemma, as the distribution of surplus from cooperation is contested. So clearly, deal or steal makes for a more flexible analysis of a wider range of social phenomena, once we add the social institutions, norms and distributional surplus. But why tie it to the clumsy narrative about prisoners? is more complex and counterintuitive than deal or steal. Carol Rose speculates on a number of reasons why this peculiar narrative may dominate. 1. Many of the stories have a very gendered lens. Chicken and Stag Hunt and Prisoner's Dilemma have characters who are at least male-coded, doing masculine things. Battle of the Sexes has a stereotypical head couple at its centre. But while Prisoner's Dilemma is a masculine-coded story, its choices are free 
from the fears of emasculation conjured up by the others. Quote, it does not expect heroism, and it gives guys a rationale for defecting and for behaving like ordinary people instead of Superman. The organisation man who plays hooky, or the breadwinner with a midlife crisis, might find that the hapless prisoner rings a sympathetic chord. None of them do what they're supposed to do, and the prisoner's story makes it all seem natural. End quote. 2. This implied immorality of the prisoner adds to the prediction that they will betray each other. It makes the betrayal feel inevitable. After all, they have already broken one social contract, why not another? I.e., even if they both agreed not to tell on each other, they have already demonstrated their untrustworthy and weak character by being criminals. 3. The story often includes a detail that the prisoners are kept in isolation and cannot communicate with each other. This isn't strictly necessary for prisoner's dilemma, but it does make the story a lot easier to tell. Technically, even if they could communicate, provided that both their final decisions are locked in before they know the other player's choice, then the logic of the game still works the same way. However, often communication and establishing trust prove to be a major part of ways better solutions in Prisoner's Dilemma can actually emerge. It implies that the difficulty is simply an externally imposed one, i.e. the jailers won't allow them to speak, rather than the innate difficulty of building trust between the two players, which makes for a much simpler narrative. 3. While these points are interesting, it is worth pointing out that there's a wide range and a weird variety of game stories which don't fit within these stereotypes. For example, there's a surreal nightmarish fairy tale version of Prisoner's Dilemma presented on Ted Ed's channel, with sentient gingerbread men having their limbs devoured for all eternity. Or the biblical story of Solomon and the Judgment, where two women come to him both claiming to be the mother of a child, where he suggests cutting in half the baby and sharing between them. The true mother abandons her claim to the child in order to protect it from this fate, and by doing so actually proves that she is actually the true mother and has given the child. Here we have a superficial version of chicken, but in the end the outcome is inverted. This seems to suggest that the assertive and competitive behaviour is either valorised or demonised based on gender norms. But I'm hesitant to read into this too much because it's actually a very common folktale throughout a very wide region over a long period of time. And there's obviously different gender norms in different societies, and there's other takeaways from this folktale which aren't fully incorporated in this analogy to chicken. Um, so, take what you want from my analysis. I don't think it's conclusive in any way. But for a look at a more modern, mainstream, centre-left variant of the game stories, I went over the examples given in the core textbook, a recent publication meant to revitalise economic education with more real-world, in-touch and up-to-date economics, but which many critics argue deviates less from the old orthodoxy than it may appear to at first sight. Their chapter on game theory centres around the tragedy of the commons in specific, its relation to the difficulties of coordinating international efforts to limit environmental degradation and climate change, a topic I will explore in greater depth in another video. Their retelling of the simpler games is there, but hardly given primary importance. Nevertheless, I think there are some interesting things in their framing. Their main characters throughout the chapter used to explain the various games are two Indian farmers, Growing rice and cassavas, they benefit from specialisation and trade through the invisible hand game, but there are negative externalities resulting from the use of pesticides which play out through prisoners' dilemma. While perhaps less generally familiar, this narrative of benefits from markets supplemented with harm from externalities is a very common economic model used to advocate for mild regulation within generally liberal politics. Uh, which has always been part of the neoclassical paradigm, coexisting with more radically libertarian theories. There are some other stories as well, some with some gender inversions of older game stories. Battle of the Sexes keeps its structure, but swaps the stereotypical gender activities. 
he wants to go to the cinema and she wants to go watch football. And in Prisoner's Dilemma, the name of the prisoners are Thelma and Louise, after two fugitives from the law in the 1991 Ridley Scott movie. A thoughtless choice given the close loyalty between the two friends, which makes it odd to imagine them calculating the personal gain from betraying each other. So in conclusion, these are toy examples, and no one seriously bases their political ideology on them. But examining their interpretation gives us tools which will be useful when looking at more complex examples that are actually offered up to explain real-world economic issues later, and allow us to see how underlying ideologies and biases may shape the way we perceive and use these models. Alright, done.